well, the effective distance A and uh, times the, the effective width here, this B. So that's the, same as, that's the same as what we've been doing with the rec rectangular beams. If you have um, this situation, then all the equations, then, then really it's just you can ignore the fact that it's a, a T-shape, and you can work it exactly, exactly as we've done all the, uh, yeah, they found a different one. <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> Who do you need? Matthew. Matthew. Oh, no, Matthew needs to calculate for No, no, OK. Something needs to be, yeah. we may not even get that far, it's such a late start. Anyway, um, so if you have this situation, and this is really the more, the more, more common scenario, then it's just the same as, a, as a, a regular rectangular beam. What happened, and the reason is, if, if the, you're, you're considering the concrete here is cracked in, in tension, so it doesn't matter what shape it is. It doesn't matter if it has holes in it. A lot of times you see, uh, concrete beams with holes uh, in the side where they, you could run uh, heating ducts or, or um, wiring or whatever. It doesn't affect the strength at all, really. It might affect the shear strength a little bit, but that's probably not the critical strength. Uh, it doesn't affect the moment because you're only, you're only using the compression concrete up here and the tensile steel down here, and what's in between in terms of uh, stiffness doesn't matter. In fact, you could, um, you could leave the concrete out. It would be a, an efficient thing. You could maybe imagine a slab that just had uh, a steel cable that ran under it in, in kind of a truss-like fashion, right? With, you could make it, and this is, I mean, kind of done sometimes, I guess. You could have a, a situation where you wanted to stiffen, I'm trying to think how I'm going to draw this. All right, let's say it's like a beam, and you have the, a cable come down and, and run under it, and, and somehow there have to be uh, some supports here. Maybe the cable runs a little bit further down. Okay, so that you have a, um, a, the slab and then the cable underneath it. That's essentially this, what you're doing here. You've just left out the the concrete, right? The concrete in between here. Um, it might be harder to uh, fabricate that, or it might also have some other problems. There'd be maybe uh, problems of, you know, keeping the cable position, but it could, you can do that, and it would be lighter weight. Anyway, I want to get off on that. So, but if this, if this drops below here, if you have a, a scenario where that neutral axis drops down here, if that's the neutral axis, then you do have a different situation. Then your C, you, you still have this equation, but the area here, this was, this is how we we're defining the area of the concrete. This is just, just like this one, except it's reversed. Uh, stress times area. This is the stress times the area. It's the same. Um, but you've, now you've got to redefine your area. Well, the area is simply, it's, it's this area. It includes a little bit down there, right? So it's not, it's not as simple as A, B. It's, you've got to tag on this little bit down here, and you have to know how much that little bit is uh, that you're going to that you're going to add on. Um, the easy way to do that is to break it into parts. That rather than rather than show it as um, just one for C, you could say that is is equal to uh, a force. Uh, a little bit more room, a C1, and another one down here. We'll break these areas into two. So we've got one there and one there, and this one would be C2. And this, this then is equal to 
uh, this same stress um, times the first area, and this one is, whoops, okay, the stress times the second area. And this uh, A1, A1 and A2 equal the, the total area, right? So you're just breaking it into pieces. And that, um, that then is easier to, it's easier to find these areas. So the procedure, if you've got that situation, uh, you, you, you have something set out like this. Assuming you're going just to, an, this is a uh, analysis problem. Uh, you've got the steel given. So if you have the steel given, you can immediately go ahead and, and do this, this calculation and find the, the T. Okay, so what, what is this suggesting here? Draw this, label this, locate T and C. Okay, find, find T. And once you find T, you can say that that's going to be equal to this. This A, this value for C, the total um, the total of those two, this C is equal to T. So if you find if you find T, then you can then you can look at this equation, and from that you can you can solve A C. If you get if you get A C, then you can come over here, and you can you can simply. Uh, find well this you, you start from the top figure out what this this area is here this a1 if a1 is is less than ac then you must be down in the, the ac must require area down in the in the uh, web if if you start if you got to that point and you found that the the area here was actually in excess it was greater than ac well, then you'd have the rectangular case, and you wouldn't have to, it'd be a, suddenly a much easier problem. You could use all the rectangular formulas. But if you, if you discover that uh, there's not quite enough area up here, then it's going to require a little bit more area down here. Whatever it requires, you just, you know, find that amount, and that's A2, so that these two add up to AC, the AC that you've already found to balance the, the tension. So you find you find you know this rather easily you know you probably know this dimension there are only oh, this uh, is the width of the web if you know this dimension uh, that then you can then you just find how deep that has to be how far that goes down to make uh, that area so that this is a this will be a one and this will be where can I draw it a2. Okay, those two areas. Now, you can, once you find those areas, well, you know this, you know F prime C, you can find, you can find C1 and C2. You can write the equations uh, to get those. Okay, now you have all the forces. You would have, <coughs> you have the tensile force, but you also have both compressive forces. And if you want to get the moment, that would just be the the uh, couple, or in this case, you've split the couple at force up there. So you'd take this distance. This would be the moment arm uh, for that force. This would be the, the moment arm for the other one. You just have to find those distances. And that's just geometric, right? This is easy to find. These are all rectangular shapes. So this is the center, the center of the flange and the center of, of this little rectangle here, half of that distance gets you to there. You find those two distances, and then, and then that's about it. The moment is just the, um, those, those couples, you split it. So you'd have C1 times its moment arm plus uh, C2 times its moment arm, right? And that equals the moment. And if you want to get, that's the, the strength moment uh, the the f design moment or the with the uh, loads, you just have to put a fee on it, a, a safety factor. So that that comes out pretty. It's pretty straightforward. Now, if you 
You see, this is actually uh, backwards from the way we work the rectangular. In the rectangular ones, we, we always solve this equation, or it's easier to solve it uh, from the bottom up rather than the top down. We saw, we said T rotated about this moment arm, right? And you get T times uh, D minus A over 2, that, that moment arm. That's the equation. Because, because there's only one distance up there. Now, you couldn't do that with this because you you'd have to find the centroid here. I mean, you could do it. Yeah, sure, you could do it. But you'd have to, it would be another extra step. You'd have to find the centroid of that step. If you do it this way, you don't even have to find the, the centroid. So it's a little bit easier to work it from the, from the compression down, the compression moment like that. Anyway, OK, here's, a, here's an example that you can look at. Um, this, is a, this is a different kind of nonlinear non or a non-rectangular um, shape. It's got a hole cut out of it. There are other examples of these. Yeah, I mean, not just T-beams or this. You know, triangle. if you had a pyramidal, it's one that's kind of fun to do because it's a varying uh, distance. You can do, I don't know, anything that's not a strict rectangle would fall into this procedure. So uh, uh, assuming you've got the strength given, you've got the amount of steel down there, and we want to find the, the strength capacity. OK, step one, like we said here, you find T. So you got to find that guy. T is ASFY, the area times um, the um, uh, yield strength of the bars. That gives you that, 360K. So that's the, that's the force that the steel's able to carry. So the compression, the concrete's going to balance that. This big, this big C here. Uh, has to balance that. So you set those two somewhere we set them equal. Okay, here first I wrote out the equation for that point. If I, F prime C, AC, okay, in numbers, the only one you don't know is AC. So you could solve it like that. Okay, that just reduces down. Now you set that uh, in for that, replace that with the force you know, and you can solve for AC. So this gives you the total. This is then, like we did here, this total area or in this case, it's, it, uh, you have to find how far down it goes. And you just start, start from the top and add up area until you get enough. <laughs> you, know, you have to have a total area of AC. It has to total out to, uh, in this case, what was it? Three, 300, what, what the heck was it? 142. So we just have to come up with 142, starting from the top. So this little bit up here is 48. And these si on the sides, that's uh, 15 each, so that's uh, 30, so that we're up to 78. So if we had 64 more, we'd have it. So you got it. You just go down until you have enough area and, and figure out how far down that is. So in this case, that would be 16 times 4 would be the 64, right? You add those up, right? That gives you the 64. Then, then you look for the, well, here first I actually calculated the, these three uh, forces, the three compression. Now I've got three instead of here. I only had two, but this is a little bit more. Um, they're 0.85. This must be, this is the 0.85 F prime C, right? That's that value, uh, which is constant. And here's the area is varying times the area each time. So this is this equation right here, except it's written backwards. The area is first. That's the area. And this is the uh, 0.85 F prime C. So that just gives you these forces. So now you got that, 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 all those forces. Now all you need are the, the three moment arms to go with them. So you just calculate those. And they're just based on, on the geometry. Each one of these arrows goes to the center of this area, right? Those each go to the, to the center of the of the area. So this, this total distance is actually then A, right? C is, I mean, really is a little bit below this. But, but this is how we calculate it based on, on this amount of area. And this is then assumed to be the rectangular uh, stress block that's coming in on it. So each one of those then, you just multiply the, 
the uh, summation of this, the forces, the compression forces times each one of these uh, moment arms. Add them up, you get a total. That would be, um, these must be kip feet. These are all in kips, right? This is kip inches, but where the heck did we get? How do we get into feet? Should have been kip inches at first. Oh, that's interesting. Where the heck did the feet come from? Maybe it's when I do this. That's, that doesn't even look like inches. Some, I must have converted it here, because I don't, I don't see the conversion. Maybe you could do this, Matthew. What's one of these? 20 times 2.55. This, oh, no, I'm sorry. This is 100, 122. Oops. 122.4, right? Times 20.5 times 20 is what? Is that the 2,000? Yeah. Okay, that's that number. That should be kip inches, huh? I wonder, I hope this is right. This might, that looks like kip inches, and this must be, this must be, this must, I think this, this, this should be a double slash. I think that should be kip inch, because this is that number. This is kip inches here, and this should be kip inches, and then it's just putting the, the fee factor on it. So that's the, the uh, design moment. So then you'd have to actually reduce that, uh, divide that by 12 to get kip feet, to, because you ultimately want it. From MU, then you go to WL squared over 8, and you want the answer in PSF so, or PLF. So everything has to be in feet after this. So usually this one you'd write in kip feet. Something I must have slipped. OK, so it's a pretty straightforward process, though. And, and you can see uh, basically how that falls out. Um, this last little bit here is just some um, tables that might be handy. Um, reference tables. You can find lots of concrete tables in, in different books. Our book doesn't have too many, really. Um, there is a book. This, these came out of a book by Jack McCormick. If you ever want to get more into um, structural design, he, that's an excellent author that I'd, I'd uh, recommend. Um, he's, still, he's still kicking, this guy. He's published a lot of books. He's a good you know, some people are good um, theorists or good, um, I guess, doing research. And I just know Jack McCormick is a, is a very good author. He's a very, very good at explaining um, the material. And he's written books on uh, steel design and concrete design and then basic statics and mechanics, um, oh, quite a series of books. They've been in print for a long time because they're good books. Uh, they're They're fairly accessible. I mean, even for, for you, I mean, after going through this course, you could easily pick one up, I think, and, and if you, on your own, wanted to get into concrete in more detail. Maybe, who knows? <laughs> or, uh, but when, I mean, when I, see, my first degree is architecture. And then after I studied architecture, I went on and, and uh, got a couple engineering degrees. So when I started in, in uh, doing the engineering courses, I mean, I had to kind of play a little cat catch up because the other engineering students were somehow, I felt, ahead of me. Um, although I don't know that they really were. But to, to uh, <laughs> what, I, what I did, I, I'd, I'd sit down, you know, for this course, like I took a steel course. So I go to the library and I got like five different textbooks on steel. And I'd set them all, I'd open them all up to chapter one, boom. Chapter one, chapter one, chapter one, <laughs> plus the textbook we were using in class, and I read all, all, all five of them. And <laughs> I had more time at that time. I only had two kids. <laughs> so, <laughs> life was much more quiet. <laughs> and and uh, so, so I'd re read all five of them, and then, and then we'd go on to you know, chapter two. So I'd jump chapter two, chapter two, chapter two, chapter two, read chapter two. On. So having done that, I mean, I, I actually did have exposure to different textbooks. And, and I decided after that, that that really the best author was Jack McCormick. He consistently explained things, you know, that I'd read it in one textbook and I'd think, huh? 
That makes no sense at all. And I'd read it in the next textbook, and you think, okay, yeah, but this doesn't seem to really make sense. If there was a step left off, they'd always say, <laughs> what's that famous line? It will be left to the reader to figure this out or something. Where they say, <laughs> sort of, you know, they start giving an example, and then it's just sort of like, dribbles away into no, 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 no. <laughs> what? <laughs> or they skip 10 steps, you know, you have no idea what's going on. So, but Jack McCormick, Jack, I don't know how he does it. And, and nice illustration, but he would just very, you could almost hear his tone. This guy, uh, he's a, a southerner, I'm sure. He's down, teaches down in Clemson. He's still, still down there and is sort of a, I think, an icon. And it's interesting. Uh, having since traveled around a little bit, you know, you go to conferences, and if it comes up, uh, the topic of textbooks, and you mention Jack McCormick, in, inside of engineering circles, people always immediately know, oh yeah, Jack McCormick, yeah, Jack McCormick. <laughs> so, I think he probably is pretty well, and, and there, um, I mean, there are other books that are in much more detail, but there, you know, when I went on and took, th that was kind of at an undergrad level. Well, I went on and took the grad courses, you know, through structures. Then there are other Solomon and Johnson or Gaylord and Gaylord, you know, for steel or Parks and Pauli for concrete. There are other books that are, you know, like this thick. And, and I mean, you have to, I mean, you, have to, you set up like five cups of coffee and you go, <laughs> you, know, you got to somehow brace yourself to read those books. But, um, but McCormick, <laughs> anyway, okay. So, <laughs> well, if you want a good book, you can read, read Jack McCormick. So now we're going to go on with what's left of today. That's, that kind of wraps up concrete. And we'll, um, what, what happens if I hit this out of here? Yeah, we don't need this. Hey. What's the picture behind this? Probably nothing interesting. Doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, now what we're going to go start start into the next topic, which is uh, deflection. So this is this is uh, kind of bonus material here. It's not be on the test on Monday, but uh, but will be probably picked up in recitation on Wednesday. Uh, deflection is kind of an, a different topic than the things we've covered so far. And it's different because um, it's the first one, I think, that deals with this aspect of design. We, we mentioned earlier that um, you can think of design or think of, of design criteria, I suppose, as to follow, uh, falling into three cat the three S's, the three S's of uh, design criteria. And this would be uh, strength, uh, which we've covered, I mean, like what we are doing just now, that's all based on strength, right? We're talking about forces, any of the, uh, you know, stress equations, P over A, MC over I, we're talking about capacity. We're talking about capacity in terms of, of just how much strength the member has. So that's usually number one. That's usually the, uh, the prime thing that you have to worry about in design. Uh, the next one is stability, right? And this is the classic example is the, the buckling. When you did your towers, they were m mostly stability problems. That's all stability. Something buckles, something snaps, the whole thing goes like this, the whole thing goes like this. You know, those are all stability problems. When I have a, when I have a, uh, a beam and it fails like that, that's stability. Those are stability um, things. Uh, which would happen before the material failed in strength. So before you reach that, that uh, crushing of the material the, or the breaking of the material, the, the thing falls over somehow. There's a last criterion, and this one 
is also, although the, the material, the, the system doesn't fail in terms of falling down and, it, and the material doesn't fail in terms of breaking, but the, the system as a whole is unusable. And this is uh, called serviceability. Okay, so that's the, that's the also, and, and serviceability we don't look at quite as much. Um, and in fact, it, it probably doesn't really control the design quite as often, but it is very important. Uh, although the, the, the members don't fail in terms of collapse or they don't fail catastrophically by the material failing, the, if, the, if the structure becomes unusable, then you know it's just it is failed. Uh, deflection is one of those criteria. If just excessive deflection, uh, the member may be perfectly sound. It may not be. It may be completely within the allowable limits. It could be very stable. If it's like this, it's pretty stable. Uh, but if it deflects like this, oh, you know, you've got you've got serious problems. Uh, you can't have that. It could be. In terms of deflection, massive deflections would interfere with other materials, be cracking the ceiling, you'd be uh, on, on a roof, you can have uh, ponding where the water would collect, you know, which is also not too good. Um, so different things like that. There are other serviceability requirements that uh, are more detailed thing. Concrete's a good one uh, in terms of serviceability. There are a lot of criteria having to do with cracking. You know, if the um, we mentioned that all that concrete around the bars is just there to kind of hold and protect the bars. It's not structural. And if it cracks and falls off, the thing's not going to fall down. But, but it's not serviceable. I mean, if you designed it in the way that that, that was likely to happen, then that, you can't do that. You have to somehow control the amount of cracking that it's not going to do that. Or uh, Another example, I think I had an illustration, ooh, in that, in that PowerPoint, wasn't it earlier, of the concrete column that was loaded and the shell cracks off. That is a, that you really do have to design for in concrete columns because that shell is unreinforced essentially. I mean, the reinforcing is on the inside of it, but it's important in terms of shielding the steel. If, if that shell cracks off and falls on the floor, uh, then you got all these bars hanging out there, but you also have, you know, kind of an ugly beam or column. So that's a serviceability. You've got to make sure that 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 the concrete um, stays in place. I don't know what other what other examples are there of serviceability. Usually, movement, drift in a story, story drift uh, could be serviceability. You know, anything that's uh, somehow causes the building to be unusable. So that's a category that this, uh, that, that deflection falls into. Um, in, in looking at it, what's going on here, uh, we define, let's say we got a beam here, okay? We define the deflection uh, based on the, the, um, Elastic curve, which is is the 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 move or the the deflection of the neutral axis. If this is the neutral axis, then what we're really talking about is the um, uh, the shifting of the el the elastic curve or the elastic uh, change in shape of of um, that neutral axis. So this would this is the ideal, I mean, this is what we're, the beam that we analyze. This is actually the true shape, the elastic curve of the beam under load. Elastic curve here. And the, the couple of things about the elastic curve, this, I guess the angle of it, is the slope. So this this angle, hmm, see this angle? No, okay, this angle. Uh, in radians, if I take that angle, not the slap, the slope, 
Okay, that's the slope, and it's measured in radians. And radians are, what are they? 180 over pi, I think, times, times r equals degrees. Is that right? Something like that. Anyway, uh, that's slope of a beam, which we'll talk about in a minute. And the other, the deflection of a beam is the deviation of, of this elastic curve from the, the kind of start point or the unloaded. The difference between the unloaded condition and the loaded condition of the elastic curve. That's, that's the, well, let me put it the other way. That's the deflection. And you'll see deflection is usually represented with a, a Greek D delta, either a big D or if it's a little deflection. <laughs> uh, OK. Now, the, the deflection is kind of controlled by a couple of parameters, three parameters, I guess. And they all, they all together uh, describe the stiffness of the beam. Um, deflection and stiffness are, are linked. If you have a, a, a very stiff beam, yep, this would be a little stiffer. This, this is stiff, stiffer than this, right? Just the orientation makes it stiffer. Um, and it deflects less. So the less stiff something is, the more it deflects. <coughs> stiffness is controlled by what's going on here. Okay, this has to do with the, the, the area, a cross-sectional uh, moment of inertia. And you know the moment of inertia is higher in this direction. This is the
zero slope. These values are the slope, right? So it starts off with zero slope. So that means it's got to start there, and it comes up, and it goes like that. So you end up with a, a slope diagram that looks like that, something like that. And then you take this area, you can calculate uh, that area, and that becomes that value with the EI on it, divided by the line. Divided by the line. Okay, so that's a start with the